Thank you very much for coming, everyone. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Ruri Halford McLeod. Ruri was involved in 2009 in a project with the museum called uh, Their Past, Your Future, which was a project that involved veterans of the Second World War and uh, members of the younger generation trying to bring the two generations together and record some oral histories from the Second World War. So Rui's um, interest and knowledge in St. Valerie has stemmed largely from that, and he's going to include some of those oral histories in the lecture today. So uh, without any further ado, thank you for coming. We are happy and proud. Well, it's lovely to be uh, here again. And I'm sorry if you uh, have all come thinking that I'm going to talk about St. Valerie in 1940 because I'm not going to talk about St. Valerie in 1940. I'm going to, uh, we shall eventually end up at St. Valerie in 1944, the liberation of St. Valerie in 1944. But I can speak about D-Day landings. Um, and um, uh, so I, I, anyway, I hope that too many of you aren't disappointed to come to the wrong picture. However, Emma and I have promised that next year, which will be the 75th um, anniversary of of um, St. Valerie, that we will, uh, that I will speak again about St. Valerie. And I did so two or four years ago, and it was so popular that I had to give the lecture twice. Anyway, this is not St. Valerie, but this is the D-Day landing. So the invasion of France. So welcome to the Museum of the Black Box for this lecture. I'll be speaking about the, today about the 51st Highland Division in Normandy as part of the work I undertook to record stories from veterans in This Happens in War, a project funded by Museums and Galleries Scotland and the Big Lottery. Uh, and this splendid slide um, comes from the Derby Courier, which featured a full page story in June uh, 2010. Um, four of those veterans gave me stories uh, about North Africa um, and about the, um, the landings in France. Uh, George Arnott, served the Royal Court of Signals, Tom Renouf served the Tyneside Scottish, and later 5th Black Watch, Ronnie Cameron served with the 1st Black Watch, and Graham Pilcher served with the 5th Black Watch, and you'll hear from uh, all of them later on. Uh, there won't be too much about tactics, uh, though I shall speak a little bit about the attack at Colombel later on after the D-Day landings, but I hope that you will get a feel for D-Day, the D-Day landings um, two photographs and stories. On a personal sort of note, my great uncle Charles uh, was one of a team of Met Office um, uh, weather forecasters who predicted uh, the weather window for the 6th of June. If you recall, on the 5th of June, the weather had been very poor, and um, in fact, Rommel had uh, gone home to celebrate his wife's uh, birthday. Um, 6th of June is also deeply uh, embedded in my wife's earliest memory. Um, she was visiting her grandfather in New Sligo, picked some bluebells and fed them to her grandfather's rabbits. Unfortunately, she forgot to close the door between the boys and the girls, and there were several unplanned uh, babies. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, the French coast. Uh, in 1943, the United States Command determined that an attack on Germany should be made through uh, Britain uh, into France. The operation was named Overlord. The Supreme Commander was U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower. British General Bernard Montgomery was named Commander of the 21st Army Group. All the invasion ground forces belonged uh, to the Army Group and General Montgomery was given charge of developing the invasion plan. There were two possible uh, invasion sites in, in, in France. The Pas de Calais, um, up here, uh, was near and uh, opposite the Kent coast. The Normandy coast, um, down here, uh, was much further away. Uh, Normandy presented serious logistical problems. Cherbourg, the principal port, was heavily fortified. Um, in a share book here. Um, though closer to, closer to England, the Pas de Calais was the more, most heavily defended landing site. Normandy was chosen as the landing site. Uh, U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was the supreme commander of op 
Operation Overlord. Um, behind him um, is uh, General Montgomery, um, here, um, Command of the 21st Army Group, speaking to Lieutenant Colonel Hopwood, 1st Battalion Black Watch. Next to him stands Major General Bullen, um, commanding 51st Highland Division, and Brigadier Oliver, on the right, um, has been promoted from command of 7th Battalion of the Black Watch to command 154 Brigade of the 51st Highland Division. Uh, General Montgomery uh, is seen here decorating Major D.L. Small, 7th uh, Battalion of the Black Watch. Major Small is sweeping a bar or second award to his military cross. And General Montgomery, of course, affected wearing um, a body, a Royal Tank Regiment uh, badge and a General Staff badge um, on his belly. He was eventually uh, uh, promoted Field Marshal. The choice of landing in Normandy, an Allied landing force on a broad front in Normandy would mount several threats to German forces. The port of Cherbourg and coastal ports further west in Brittany uh, could be attacked. An overland attack would be made towards Paris. From Paris, an attack would be made to the border with Germany. Normandy was less well defended. Normandy was also an unexpected jumping off point. Uh, there was potential to confuse and scatter German defending forces. The initial plan proposed a landing uh, from the sea by three divisions, with two brigades landing by air. In total, 47 divisions would be committed to the Battle of Normandy. 19 divisions would be British, five Canadian, one Polish under British command. There would be 21 American divisions with one free French division. In total, there would be over a million troops. General Mon um, uh, Montgomery presented his strategy for the invasion. He envisaged a 90-day battle ending when all the forces reached uh, the River Seine. The objective for the first 40 days was to create a bridgehead. This would include Camp and Cherbourg, a vital deep water port. The breakout from the bridgehead would liberate Brittany and its Atlantic ports. After 90 days, the Allies would control a zone bounded by the River Loire in the south and the Seine uh, to the north. Here's the Loire here. So Montgomery and Vivid that he would control all that. Adolf Hitler's German forces had been defeated in North Africa. The Russian campaign had failed. He knew that the Allies would attempt to land on the French coast. The Germans had created an Atlantic wall along the coasts of France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, and Norway. And you can see there was an awful lot that they had to, uh, they had to defend all the way up here. Uh, Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt was Commander-in-Chief in the West, and Field Marshal Erwin Rommel uh, was given command of Army Group B in France, Belgium, and Holland. Come and sit in. Rommel quickly saw that though the ports were well defended, the coasts in between were not. He started a massive program of building defences in the steel and concrete obstacles on the high watermark. Rommel set huge numbers of booby traps. Defences, however, in Normandy, uh, here, uh, were not completed. Uh, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel commanded uh, German Army Group B in France, Belgium, and Holland. Um, he is seen here inspecting the Atlantic defences. Though much trumpeted in German propaganda, the defences were not complete in June 1944. Rommel had taken the surrender of the 51st Highland Division at St. Valery en Caux on the 12th of June 1940. After initial successes in North Africa, he had been defeated uh, by the 8th Army at Al Alamein and then driven out of Tunis. The field marshal wears his uh, Knight's Cross and Pour le Merite, uh, which is this small medal underneath, which he gained in the First War, which is the German equivalent of the Victoria Cross, and he carries a field marshal's baton. This postcard epitomizes German strength. The steel helmet has an eagle above a swastika. The swastika was the Nazi party emblem, which had been incorporated into all German insignia. The bayonet hangs an iron cross with a swastika and the date 1939 uh, behind our oak leaves for courage. 
written in gold lettering at the bottom, hard to see, is Es kein nun einer Sieger und das sind wir. There can only be one winner and that is us. Uh, the postcard came from George Arnott's uh, collection. The German forces in Normandy consisted of two good divisions and there were also two good divisions made up of medically unfit Germans and conscripted Poles and Russian prisoners of war. Rommel had wished to concentrate his tanks around Paris. Hitler, however, insisted on dividing the armor units. A full moon for a night attack and a high tide uh, were required for the assault. And the 5th of June 1944 was the most likely date, but the weather was stormy. The German troops were stood down. Rommel traveled east to attend his wife's birthday party. Weather forecasts from ships in the Atlantic indicated that the weather would improve by the 6th of June, and despite opposition, General Eisenhower decide, decided to make D-Day uh, the 6th of June. Uh, Adolf Hitler, German Führer, uh, was overall commander of the German forces. He often he imposed his own ideas uh, on his generals. Here he is seen greeting Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, uh, who had just returned from defeat of the, the defeat of the Africa Corps uh, in North Africa. Rommel's dash and propaganda had made him the most famous general uh, in Europe. Hitler liked to wear a brown uniform, but without insignia of rank. The 51st Highland Division returned from Italy uh, in 1943. Uh, on the departure of Douglas Wimberley, for Staff College, the new divisional commander was Major General Bullen Smith. The, div the division started training for the invasion of Europe. And this sheet shows the 51st Highland Division tactical unit numbers and colours, um, which we have in the collection upstairs. And you have details of the sheets. It's a sort of ephemera that excites history buffs. In fact, the McBride collection, he was a Canadian, but see some more of his stuff, is absolutely amazing because he kind of kept the daily orders and maps and uh, the program, the piping program for the return to the valley, all sorts of things that they you know, would normally get uh, completely lost. And this is the 7th Battalion Blackwatch battle flag, um, 69 on brown. So you'll see if you look on the, the sheet, 69 on brown. Uh, it's interesting, almost every battalion had their own, made up their own little, little ba battle, um, battle, battle, battle flag. In early 1944, there was much more confidence in Britain. German armies had been driven out of North Africa. Allied armies were fighting in Italy. German armies had been defeated in Russia. The North Atlantic was now clear of German U-boats. United States had joined the Allies. There were many American soldiers in Britain. It was clear that the Allies would invade continental Europe. A huge amphibious, amphibious landing would be difficult. It was not clear exactly where the troops would land. The 51st Highland Division was sent into rigorous training. All units were trained in amphibious landings. Before departing, the battalions of the Black Watch were inspected by the Queen. Uh, Elizabeth Bowes Lyon was from Angus, from Glams, and one of her brothers, fighting with the Black Watch, had been killed in the First World War. She had married the Duke of York, he became King George VI in 1937, and she was appointed Colonel in Chief of the regiment. Uh, the Queen here is accompanied by Captain Arthur Penn, and behind him is uh, Brigadier Oliver. Uh, speaking with Colonel Hopwood, who commanded um, the battalion. Uh, the Blackwatch soldiers' uh, patches are cut in the shape of Blackwatch badge, St. Tandler's cross from the star. The top is Blackwatch tartan. Two red bars for 153 Brigade, that's the 5th Blackwatch, and three red bars for 1st and 7th Battalions. And uh, I have um, a jacket here, um, uh, which we mocked up, um, for uh, our collection, our handling connection, um, with the HD at the top, two bars, and the um, <coughs> black watch there at the bottom. 
Um, the other jacket, which is which is really interesting, um, on the other side is um, Lieutenant James McBride's blouse. On the right, he was a Can Loan officer. Can Loan, Canadian Loan officer, loaned from the Canadian Army to make up the shortage of British officers. By 1944, we were desperately short uh, uh, of officers. He was from Montreal, and he joined Seventh Black Watch at Breville after the D-Day landings. The word Canada is embroidered um, here and here um, above, uh, uh, above the uh, HD badge, as well as the 1939-45 star and French and German star, he was awarded the Canadian Territorial Medal with a silver maple leaf, um, uh, which is this one here, with silver maple leaf on the Look at a James Oliver's uh, 154 Brigade pennant, uh, made of blue cloth, is there for 51st Hound Division HD in red, below the three red bars to indicate 154 Brigade. It was much weathered from being flown off uh, Brigadier uh, Oliver's Jeep, and we have it upstairs. And there are, if you go upstairs, you'll see some of these other um, items of that. Brigadier James Oliver was an Arbroad solicitor. <coughs> He had joined the Territorial Army and was a major in 1939. He commanded the 7th Black Watch in North Africa. He was twice awarded the DCO for his leadership in October 1942 and in January 1943. He was promoted brigadier and commanded 152 Brigade. At the Normandy landings, he was given command of 154 Brigade. He was made a commander of the British Empire for his leadership in the Normandy uh, breakout. Now, uh, George Arnott, uh, we're going to hear from now, uh, will uh, speak about preparations for the invasion of France. He had joined the Royal Signals and was sent, uh, to, um, sent to North Africa. There he joined the headquarters of 51st Highland Division at Tripoli. He was in Tunisia and Algeria. He crossed to Sicily and Italy before returning to Britain uh, with the division. In this oral history, George describes how he had no idea where the 51st Highland Division was going in France. The, uh, the pre-invasion time well, it was uh, wonderfully kept secret. Uh, uh, no one uh, knew what was happening, and um, I think we probably suspected that we might be going uh, into action somewhere, but again, we had no idea where it might have been. Uh, basic training was simply um, uh, back on limited rations and uh, uh, a lot of exercise and um, living rough almost, which was good for us because when you uh, when you're away into a situation like Normandy, you you do live rough, and, and we were fit enough to do it. Again, I couldn't remember exactly when it was. It was a few days, I think, before the D-Day landing. Uh, I remember the uh, the uh, sort of watchtower things that are at the uh, Thames Estuary, uh, sort of forts on, on lakes, which were rather stark. And we were shelled during our passage through the Straits of Dover, and one of the ships ahead of us was hit, in fact, we saw that out. It wasn't a very happy thing to see. Um, but we kept going, obviously, and we got there. One of the things that was particular about the, the sailing over to Normandy was that we used to get soup in tins, which had their own heating device inside the tin. And you, you like a, a ring pull, you pulled a ring pull from the center of the top of the tin, which actuated a, uh, a heating element, and, and there you are, you had a tin of hot soup. Um, George was 20 years old when he went out to, do, um, uh, to uh, North Africa. Um, next to him is the signaler on the right. And you'll notice that uh, proudly he's wearing the eight on his, um, uh, his Africa, uh, North Africa star there. Um, George uh, sketched a Liberty boat being hit in the Straits of Dover. He said it was not a very happy thing to see ships being destroyed. 
uh, the 51st Highland Division was carried to France in a multitude of ships. Ronnie Cameron recalls that civilians knew where the troops were going. Ronnie Cameron joined the Black Watch. He was trained in Perth. He was posted to the 1st Battalion of the Black Watch uh, when it returned to Britain in 1943. He was a skilled shot and became a sniper. In this oral history, Ronnie Cameron describes discovering where he was. Mr. Bowden knew more than we ever knew, and they told us that. And when we got onto the train, they go there to talk to me. They were coming in, all the civilians were coming in and giving them cigarettes, sweetness, and wishing all the best, taking hands. So they knew, but we didn't, we weren't hands, but they were hands. Yes, in the morning, we light it up, I was smoking, and thank God I was getting my hands. But we were up in the deck. We see the lights, and I said to one of the sailors, "Which part of England is that?" I said, "I'm sorry, lad." He says, "That's the coast of France." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. 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 Note that the Ballard balloons. The invasion launched. The headline in the Gazette from Montreal. This is from the McBride collection again. <coughs> on D-Day, the British Second Army, commanded by General Dempsey, was on the right. The army consisted of two corps. The 30th Corps on the left was led by the 50th Division, to the 7th Division and 49th Division in, in reserve. The Tyneside Scottish, a black box battalion, was part of the 49th Division. The 1st Corps, on the right, was led by uh, 3rd Division and the 3rd Canadian Division, with the 51st Highland Division in reserve. Each division consisted of three brigades with supporting artillery, engineers and services. Each uh, brigade consisted of three battalions. A sword beach was on the right around the village of Lyon sur Mer. The British 3rd Division came ashore with light casualties. The divisional commander was Major General Tom Rennie, Black Watch. He had commanded 154 Brigade of the 51st Highland Division in Sicily. The division um, had advanced by 8 kilometers at 5 miles by the end of the day. They failed, however, to make some of the ambitious targets set by General Montgomery. In particular, Caen. A major objective was still in German hands by the end of D-Day. It would remain so until the 8th of August, more than 60 days later. The Canadian 3rd Division landed on Juno Beach, around the village of Courcelles. Uh, it faced heavy battery and machine gun nets, pillboxes and other concrete fortifications. Despite the obstacles, Canadians were off the beach within hours and advancing inland, and the Canadians were the only units to reach their D-Day objectives. Most units fell back a few kilometers uh, to uh, defensive positions. The 50th Division landed on Gold Beach around the village of Aramarch. Um, and uh, I'm delighted that we have a, a lady here in the audience who uh, was in Aramarch in 1948 and remembered the ruined houses and still there. The divisional commander was Major General Douglas Graham, who had commanded a brigade of the 51st Highland Division in Sicily. Casualties were heavy. The Germans had strongly fortified the village on the beach. The division overcame these difficulties and advanced almost to the outskirts of Bayeux by the end of the day. Uh, one by three brigade, including the 5th Black Watch, uh, landed on the Normandy coast on the 6th of June. Uh, by 2 p.m., the brigade was a mile and a half inland and had made contact with the Canadian division. The 5th Battalion, Black Watch, was tasked with capturing a radar station. This was found to be heavily defended by the Germans. The radar station was bypassed. Divisional headquarters, however, was unable to land that day. 152 Brigade landed quickly on the 7th of June, that's D plus 1, and concentrated at Doom. Only half of its transport was able to land that day. The 154 Brigade, including the 1st and 7th Down Black Watch, landed on the 10th of June, that's D plus 4. <coughs> 
landing on the beaches in Normandy, men of the 6th uh, Battalion Black Watch going ashore in training exercise and vehicles preparing to go ashore. The soldiers of the 51st Battalion Division had been transported to the French coast in a variety of ships. When close to the shore, soldiers had to transfer to landing craft. The beaches were covered with wire and obstacles. This is George Arnott's sketch of the Normandy beaches. He shows a number of smaller landing craft, infantry, LCIs, and larger landing craft tanks, LCTs, uh, leaving the mother ship. Uh, Tom Renouf uh, volunteered for the Black Watch. Uh, he was trained in Perth and joined the Tyneside Scottish in early 1944. He came ashore with our reserve company, the Tyneside Scottish, on, on the 9th of June, D plus 3. He landed the left side of the uh, bridge at Oostrom. In this oral history, Tom Renouf, Tyneside Scottish, describes going ashore on the beach uh, in Normandy. We were our company. We uh, had a fairly easy time landing, but it wasn't so easy getting off the ship. You had to get off the ship, and then you had to climb down the rigging. Now, just imagine climbing down the rigging with a full kit, a large pack, a small pack, your helmet, your rifle, ammunition, it, it was really quite a load that you had to carry. Uh, and then you were coming down the rig, and in this little boat down at the bottom, a landing craft, which took about uh, 60 people, I think, at most. Uh, and you had to land on this landing craft. So we were greatly indebted to the naval ratings who were there, waiting for you down at the bottom. And of course, the boat was bobbing up and down something terrible. Quite a frightening experience. However, when you got down there, the naval boys, uh, they, had a, they, they knew their job pretty good. And they said, OK, Jock, okay, just do what I tell you to do. Got down the bottom there. The boat came up, let go. He grabbed a hold of you, jumped on the boat, and then you were going down into the trough once again. I don't remember anybody falling off. I think everybody landed safely. And I think that that was quite a feat. It was not an easy job, laden as you were, and also trying to time it so that you got the timing right, because that was critical. Uh, quite a feat, nobody fell out, nobody was, uh, had to be rescued. And we didn't have much opposition at all. We went ashore, I'm not terribly sure just exactly where it was, but from my memory, I would have thought that it was Wiesstraum that we went ashore. Uh, so we were pretty well at the left end of the, uh, the, the bridgehead. No great problem, which the beach was still being shelled. And so the beach marshals, as they were called in those days, in charge of the beach, they were there to guide everyone and to direct them. And of course, you got a good volley. Get moving, and they weren't allowed, they didn't want you hanging around the beach for your own safety and to keep the beach clear. And so as soon as you put your foot on the beach, uh, we landed fairly safely. These landing craft took us in, and I think we maybe got our ankles and uh, our calves wet, but we got ashore there and uh, directed straight away, right, get moving. That was it, get moving, and everybody had to move it as quickly as possible. Uh, the obstacles on the beach in Normandy, iron girders, stakes and mines had been placed on the beach by the Germans. By the time Tom Renouf landed, many obstacles had been cleared away. Uh, these are some Canadian commanders coming ashore on Nan Red Beach, that's on Judo Beach, at St. Aubert, sur mer Ramps had been lowered from the landing craft to allow men ashore. Even so, many of them got wet uh, to their armpits. And uh, this is the uh, landing on Juno Beach. Uh, note the bicycles uh, here yeah, being being uh, being carried ashore. And this is amazing where they landed absolutely in front of the houses. Uh, you can see some of them heavily bombed uh, here. <coughs> then I found this car too. You can take it easy, mate. We cleared this beach a fortnight ago. <laughs> um, 
and he, he did, uh, his name was MacDonald, um, I forget which paper it came from, but he had a whole series of wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful cartoons. The Normandy Bocage and fighting in Normandy, uh, being the reserve division of the 1st Corps, the 51st Highland Division, was not used as a single cohesive unit. Brigades and battalions were sent off to reinforce other units. The Allied advance quickly ground to a halt around the large city of Caen. There was intense shelling and bombing by the Germans. On the 18th of June, 154 Brigade got across the river Orne. It was put under command of 6th Airborne Division, which had been parachuted into Normandy with heavy losses and much confusion on D-Day. 153 Brigade with 5th Black Watch uh, made an attack on Breville with heavy losses. A company was almost wiped out. Uh, some Black Watch prisoners were put up against a wall and shot by the Germans, and other soldiers lost their nerve. Now, in Anthony Beaver's book, Otherwise Balanced D-Day, which you should all have read, or um, got an access of. He wrote that the Can Canadian paratroopers were contemptuous of the Scottish regiments involved. The thing that shocked me was 51st Highland Division, wrote a major of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. Three different times our division restored your situation to them. If you could have seen our lads come up to help them out on one occasion and call them yellow bastards, where the Scottish the Scotties threw their equipment and fled. Lieutenant Colonel Otway had to take a battalion of the Black Watch under command because the commanding officer broke down. Beaver had the grace to add that they lost 200 men in their first attack. Uh, the Black Watch chaplain noted that the men had been mown down in platoon formation. And the officers and men were drafted into battalions from England, uh, from Tyneside Scottish. So the 5th Black Watch um, had a very bad, uh, very bad, bad time at Braville. 154 Brigade, with 1st and 7th Black Watch, was ordered to reduce St. Honorine and Demobile, but was repulsed. St. Honorine was not taken until the 22nd of June. 152 Brigade was thrown into a, a bitter fighting at the Triangle, which was not smashed until the 21st of July. The open warfare of North, uh, the North African desert turned into bitter hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the woods and steep-sided lanes, uh, which in Normandy are called Bocage. Uh, the German Panther and Tiger tanks outclassed the British and American tanks. In particular, the German 88mm anti-tank gun was feared by all vehicles. General Montgomery's plan had failed to gain the ground needed for a deep bridgehead. There was not enough room for new units and airfields to be set up out of range uh, of German gunfire. The uh, morale of the 51st Highland Division uh, was affected. So in this uh, next oral history, which I hope you'll be able to hear, is by uh, Ronnie Cameron. Uh, he describes how he first heard shell fire in Normandy uh, and never got his boots off. The war is, but it was after me, more or less, that that had been the fire release after it, really bad. Because it was an old soldier, it was in one of the trenches I was in, and he uh, said, how are you feeling mad after that? Oh, I said, not too good, but I said, thank God it stopped. And I said, uh, at least they didn't do as much harm, or if the fire, I said, that was out of the way till other things started. <laughs> Never got his boots off. Um, a Bowman's 40 mm anti tank gun being prepared for action and um, gunfire at night um, over Caen. Um, Allied gunfire was frightening for forward troops. And, uh, was as frightening for forward troops as uh, was German fire. And here we have some uh, pictures of soldiers uh, <coughs> marching uh, along a canal. You see armed uh, rifle with a brain gun in the middle here, um, carrying the, the helmets and scrim on, pouches at the front. 
And of course, everybody digs. This is Private Smith of 50,000 Black Watch digging a trench. Soldiers were always digging trenches every time they halted. The trench gave some protection against artillery and aircraft uh, fire. Uh, in the next, um, the next video, um, uh, George Arnott uh, describes being attacked by German Stuka bomber, bombers and the hard fighting. <laughs> Well, we came under fire from several aircraft. The Stuka bomber was uh, one which uh, had gull-shaped wings and a siren in its uh, wheels or legs or somewhere, um, and made a terrible noise when it died. And one of the weapons of war is fear, uh, is to try and make people frightened either by the noise of you're about to be hit with a bomb or, or shells coming over, things like that. And uh, this is um, uh, George Arnott's sketch of the Orne Bridge. The uh, bridge came to be known as Pegasus Bridge because it had been captured by the paratroopers. Pegasus, the flying horse, uh, was the emblem of the paratroopers. And here we have um, a photograph of uh, bombs falling from a German Junkers uh, JU-87 dive bombers. It was known as a Stuka, which stood for Sturzkampfflugzeit meaning die bomber in German. In lots of German words, they took the STU from the beginning and the KA from Kamp. It was known as the Stuka. It had addictive gull wings and a fixed undercarriage. It was fitted with a Jellico trumpet, which was a wailing siren. The screaming sound terrified soldiers on the ground. A German Luftwaffe wing and fuselage markings with a square black cross edged with white. This dramatic photograph was taken by an aircraft behind. Um, in the next um, uh, video, uh, George Arnott uh, describes how the soldiers of the 55th Talent Division were constantly under German observation. Hard. Um, now, breaking hard. Uh, you, you were not able to move. We were under observation from the Germans. There was a, a, a place called Column Bells where they had a, some kind of a works which had a high chimney and they were able to see what we were doing. Our own forces uh, tried to bomb the chimney and shell the chimney and get rid of the chimney but they never succeeded. Um, so we, it was a long, hard fought time. Uh, we were quite relieved when they finally managed to get through and break out. And this is the factory column bell uh, with those tall chimneys that despite all the bombing and shooting were never shot down. Um, this is a German photograph with some German uh, soldiers in the front wearing their distinctive coal scuttle um, hats, helmets. Uh, in the next uh, oral history, Ronnie Cameron, the Black Watch in Normandy, describes being ordered to get a haircut. Oh yes, I really. But I said, <coughs> not long after we landed in France, and uh, he told us all to get a haircut, so no one whacked me in, I can tell you. So we said, wait. We did all right, and we waited until we got to common, and they would get a haircut. And if you read that, the promise we have to get a beer cup or we'll get a cup of um, army barber. And we really just go in the club, you understand, and never go in the barber shop. So we had to fall back on our own barber. And he would be fussy as long as he got the yellow. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a, a wonderful first World War um, cartoon I find. Uh, keep your head still. Uh, have you bring the ear off? <laughs> whistled, whistled over the top. Um, and um, this was George Arnott's sketch of Carl <laughs> when they eventually got there. Um, and uh, this is in fact is the rubble of Carl when they had to use bulldozers to um, uh, to get through um, through the, the streets. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Colombelle, the attack on Colombelle, uh, and this uh, splendid map 
uh, which again from the McBride, uh, um, the McBride collection. Uh, and this is the factory. You can see the buildings quite clearly here. Uh, the factory at, um, at Colombell, um, which um, had to be attacked. On the 11th of July, Brigadier Nat Murray, commanding 153 Brigade, was ordered, against his better judgment, to take the factory at Colombell. The tall chimneys, used as German observation posts, dominated the battlefield. Repeated shelling and bombing had failed to demolish the chimneys. First Gordon's was to advance on the right to attack Colin Bell. The 5th Battalion of the Black Watch, commanded by Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Chick Thompson, was to take uh, a crossroad and, and northeast corner of the factory. The 2nd Gordon Battalion, the 5th 7th, was to pass through the Gordons and then occupy the factory area. Engineers were <coughs> to drop, destroy the chimneys. A Company, 5th Battalion of the Black Watch, advanced and captured the German anti tank gun. B Company passed through A Company and took the crossroads. And C Company, commanded by Major Graham Pilcher, passed through as well. Initial objectives were taken. Ten British tanks were then called up. Five German panzers trundled up. They destroyed all the Allied Sherman tanks in their first salvo. The Gordons were unable to advance to take their objectives or the factory. Fifth Black Watch was exposed without support. It was unable to maintain its position. Well, this, this was a, a, a most unpleasant uh, order to have to give to, uh, to, the, to the commanders that, that, that uh, commu communication was suddenly, suddenly opened up. And we were given orders to come back. But because the Germans were coming, they, were, they weren't all that far away and were being shelled and mortared and things like that. And uh, th there, was, uh, there was never any chance, and I take a red face for this, and there was never any chance that we were going to um, get, go back in good order. So I, I was quite... I, I was quite um, certain that the only thing to do was to order them to get back as well as they could. But um, my company, my company, um, Son Major, he's very good at it, and, and uh, he, he and I did, did, did our best to see that everybody got back. But I mean, Despite, despite, despite that, well, and I lost. I, I did lose. I did lose um, an officer in that in, in that in that in that retreat. I don't know what happened to him because he was uh, he he, uh, he was um, he, he, uh, he he was never he was never found. It was a, an operation I wasn't proud of at all because one didn't. One didn't have control of it. Uh, dear um, Graham, he had um, joined the Territorial Army in 1935 and was called up in 1939 to join the 4th Black Watch. Um, and he was sent to France in 1940 where he was wounded and was um, taken out of Cherbourg uh, just as the 51st Highland Division surrendered at St. Valery. He joined the 4th Battalion in Britain and they were sent to Gibraltar. And after the losses on D-Day, he was summoned to France. And on June the 26th, that was D plus 20, he was made commander of C Company, the Black Watch. Um, and um, uh, so when C Company was exposed on outflank Colin Bell, Graham uh, lost radio contact with the battalion. And perhaps you didn't catch the very beginning. He had to give the order for his platoon to fight to the last bullet because he had lost radio contact. Fortunately, he then recovered radio contact. 153 Brigade's attack on the fact that Colin Bale resulted in heavy casualties. Five officers and 66 other ranks were killed or missing, and three officers and 54 other ranks were wounded. Um, Graham puts it here on the left with Captain Alistair Garnett in 1944. Both were with uh, 4th Black Watch, and on the right, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chick Thompson, 5th Black Watch. Graham Pilcher and uh, Chick Thompson was summoned to brigade headquarters where they explained what had happened to Colin Bell. 
As a result of the meeting, General Montgomery sacked Major General Bullen Smith. He had never been a popular commander. He was a lowlander. Everybody bitterly resented the fact that Montgomery had, uh, had replaced Douglas Wimberley. And one of the thoughts was that, in fact, Douglas Wimberley didn't like anybody else to be famous except him. And Douglas Wimberley at the 51st Highland Division, at the time, was the most famous division uh, in the British Army. And, and, and Montgomery didn't like that. So Douglas Wimberley was sent off to, uh, to Star College. <coughs> Uh, Major General Douglas Wimberley, who had commanded the division in North African Sicily, uh, offered to return, but, but, but Montgomery would not let him leave his new job. Instead, uh, Tom Rennie was given command. And these are the ruins of Columbell. Eventually, it took two divisions to capture uh, the, the factory. I mean, uh, they had sent one brigade to try and capture it. Uh, and you can see even at the end how much was standing. And you only need to you can see that you only need to be right up there to see how difficult um, it all was. <laughs> so Major General Thomas uh, Reddy, Tom Reddy joined the Black Watch. He had been taken prisoner at St. Valerie in 1940 uh, when the 51st Highland Division had surrendered. He was the brigade major, and he had the unenviable task of going round telling all. Uh, the battalions that they were to surrender in 15 minutes. And of course, a lot of them had never seen the enemy at port at all. Uh, he was taken prisoner, uh, and then he found a bicycle, and he cycled from St. Valerie to Marseilles uh, across France and got back uh, that way. And quite a few others uh, did as well, but he. Uh, uh, he, um, he managed to escape. So he was a major in 1940, uh, a major general uh, by 1944. And of course, a lot of the people who were taken at St. Valerie um, were you know, lieutenants and captains at the start of the war, and they were lieutenants and captains at the end of the war. Um, he had commanded the 5th Battalion of Black Watch at the Battle of El Alamein, uh, and he's uh, in the famous picture of the briefing by Douglas Wimberley. He had commanded 154 Brigade in Sicily. He was promoted Major General. He commanded the 3rd Division on the Normandy landings, uh, when and, uh, initially landing on D-Day, but was wounded on D plus 7. He was invalided back to England, and he was then given command of the 51st um, Highland Division. <coughs> The fighting came at huge cost. In two battles, the Black Watch had lost more than 300 men, killed, missing, or wounded. And these are the uh, original crosses uh, from, uh, uh, from Bravia. And these are the uh, crosses of uh, Corporals Middleton and Collier, 7th Black Watch, taken, a photograph taken in 1948. And here we have some veterans at Braville, Sid, Le Sid Lum um, on the left, Tom Renouf, uh, Graham Pilcher, Doug Rogers at the Braville Cemetery in 1996. Of course, it's Sid Lund who um, gave us an amazing collection of medals, which we have in the museum here. Uh, the fifth Bla uh, Black Watch uh, veterans are all wearing red hackles in their bonnets and medals on their chest. And this is the Braville Cemetery um, as it now is. And uh, the 51st um, Highland Division Association commissioned a bronze figure of a piper for the memorial at Braville. Behind the figure is the 51st Highland Division banner with the letters HD. Tom Renouf uh, is uh, on the right. Uh, where's Tom Renouf? There's Tom Renouf. Um, Sid, Lan, Sid Lan is on the extreme, uh, uh, <coughs> the extreme right. <coughs> Under Major General uh, Tom Rennie's command, the 51st Highland Division was to fight its way past the ruins of Caen towards the River Seine. There was fierce fighting in which Tom Renouf, who had now joined the 5th Black Watch, was wounded but returned to the battalion. Uh, at the crossing of the Rhine, he was later to be awarded the Military Cross. He was commissioned later uh, in 1945. Uh, Tom Rennie, who had been made a prisoner at St. Valerie on Coe on the 12th of June 1944, led the 51st Highland Division back 
for the capture of St. Valery in September, and then took La Havre. Here he has seen the French children at St. Valery. And uh, really? as they all came in, this is the, this is the Marie, the mayor of the town. Um, the French had looked after all the graves of all the soldiers who had been killed. Um, Tom Rennie placed all the, uh, uh, all the <coughs> battalions in the, the positions where they had been on the 12th of June. Uh, there was a pipe, uh, uh, all the pipe bands played a retreat, uh, and there's quite a well-known tune uh, called, now called A Return to St. Valerie. Sadly, Tom um, Rennie was killed uh, at the crossing of the Rhine uh, in March uh, 1945. We had already made the crossing as he was coming back. Uh, he was riding in a jeep, and though his signaller and driver survived, uh, he was killed. And briefly, uh, 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 Oliver uh, took command of 51st Highland Division. So here was a man who had started the war as a, a territorial major, commanding a division uh, at, um, um, at, uh, at the crossing the Rhine. And he was, uh, Tom Ray was eventually um, replaced by Babe McMillan from, from the uh, Argyles. <coughs> Ronnie Cameron was at St. Valery when his elder brother had been made prisoner. Here, members of the 51st Highland Prison Association are at the memorial at St. Valery. Tom Renouf um, in the kilt, uh, and Derek, uh, Tom Renouf here, yeah, and Derek, um, um, Derek Lang, seated. Derek was the, the chairman of the association. In Holland, uh, Ronnie Cameron was shot in the face from point blank range, and he survived and recovered and was sent out to Malaysia in June 1945. Um, George Arnott, uh, was to head northeast to Holland, where after Arden, the Ardennes offensive, he was invalided home and discharged. He died in 2013 after he'd been interviewed for the project. Graham Pilcher was awarded the military cross among the canals of Holland, uh, not far from Bremerhaven, but not far from Bremerhaven. In April 1945, he was badly wounded when diving into a trench. I remember him telling me that. They heard they, 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 his driver had stupidly left his jeep on a crossroads. And of course, all crossroads are immediately picked up by German artillery. And they were digging a trench, and they heard his bullet, they heard the shell coming, and everybody, um, everybody died from the trench. And he was the last one to get in. And he, um, I would say, the latest person I would mention that he was shot in the arse, but anyway, he was really badly shot in the arse, bit and exposed, uh, and was seriously ill. And uh, when uh, the courier reported, when they heard that Graham Pilcher uh, had been wounded uh, in France, the headline was, uh, Forfarshire Batsman Wounded in Germany. He <laughs> <laughs> was a great, he was a great, uh, was a great uh, so anyway, uh, dear um, uh, Graham, I died in March 2010 after he'd been interviewed for the project. So the 51st Island Division entered St. Valerie and then took Le Havre. It turned northeast towards Holland and Germany, but those are other stories. Yes, there was a huge argument, and, uh, and um, as I say, he went, up, went 
to, to column down much against much against his will. One of the interesting things that uh, the Graham told me was that, um, that they eventually, as they advanced, they eventually got to the German uh, troops. But in front of them, they actually went through. They kind of walked through these um, outer defences, which were manned by Poles and Russian prisoners of war, who of course didn't want anything to do with the fighting and just hid in their trenches. So they kind of steamed through the first line, but of course when they hit the second line and the tanks took out the thing. So and they said, he, uh, Graham said it was the most difficult decision he'd ever had in his life was to tell his men, to order his men to fight the last bullet. Because that's in a way is kind of consigning them to almost certain death. Well, if there's no more questions, um, I'll just say a couple of things. About, uh, we should be getting today our next event program printed for July to September. It should be arriving today, so it do pick one up the next time you're in. All our events for the next few months are online, and uh, we do have some great art workshops coming up with uh, artist Robin Leishman, and we've got some truffle making courses in August, and um, some more music performances coming up, and uh, some more talks as well, so please do have a look, and if you aren't already signed up for the newsletter, you can do that uh, with one of the comment cards outside, or on your evaluation form, so please do fill out an evaluation form if you have a few minutes, and um, there's some pencils up here, and if you'll just join me one more time in thanking you. And I promise, I promise that we will talk about some